So, Craig, we look forward to what you've got to share. Mm, thank you, Tom. Thank, thank you, everybody. Woe betide the person who speaks last on a Saturday afternoon. Huh? <laughs> I shall do my best. But one and all, I do find myself in an interesting position to speak to you for half an hour about a project that has hardly yet begun. But I'll do my best, and perhaps the question and answer session will be as revealing as any that I can tell you in the, in the time before it. Because the effort to write this latest official history of Australian operations in the Middle East and East Timor has just begun, literally has. My team began on the 1st of July this year, though I've been at the War Memorial for a few extra months. So I'll start by talking about the history of this history project, for even at the early stage it frames what I think is a unique set of circumstances and contexts that surround this latest official history undertaking. Now in my mind there's no question that each of the official history series that have gone before have faced their own specific challenges and enjoy their own individual, individual advantages. And you've heard many of those throughout the last two days, I'm sure. At the same time, to me at least, there is an evolution to this process. It seems to have been to some degree incremental. I put it to you at the outset that this latest series, dealing with a range of ADF, of ADF operations near and far from Australian shores, marks not a development marks not an evolution of past experience so much as signalling an entirely new paradigm. That's a bold exclamation. I'm fond of t trying to tear those down. I'll try to, uh, try to explain how I get to that conclusion as I go. That is, this project is not and cannot be a repeat of past experience updated into the new era. This is especially so in terms of the mechanics of research and the environment under which the team labours, it's less so, of course, in terms of the tradition and the philosophy behind past Australian official histories, which I'm part of, I'm proud to say, and of course would try to enhance. And here I'll cover a few points raised by Professor Horner, because one context or one facet of this project is that it is derived directly from his efforts and from the peacekeeping series that went before it. I'll cover some of the ground David did, not to repeat, but to certainly set the scene of that context. For although talked about in a number of academic and public service and even political circles for some time, the real impetus behind the series of which I have oversight came directly through Professor Horner's efforts as the official historian of Australian peacekeeping, humanitarian and post-Cold War operations, as David described. Not only is he my immediate predecessor in this role, I've got to say, I don't mean to embarrass you here, David, an important uh, source of advice and counsel as well. Initially, when David was appointed in 2004, as he outlined, Cabinet authorised the researching and writing of all multinational operations and post-Cold War operations in which Australia had been a key actor since 1947, but excluding ongoing operations in Timor, Afghanistan and Iraq. With the only explanation, as David mentioned, given that, that these operations were ongoing. When ADF operations in Timor temporarily ceased in 2006, <coughs> again an effort was made to incorporate Timor into the peacekeeping series and again it was denied. Time passed, I was at the book launch where David agitated in very strong terms to have this series reconsidered once more. He spoke, I recall the words being, but you can correct me, David, national disgrace in the ongoing failure to capture and publicise the history of these ongoing operations. And the wheels began to turn, as, as David's outlined. Kevin Rudd, who was present as Foreign Minister, gave his support, and the commissioning of the new study uh, happened, feasibility study, that is, to capture Australian involvement in Iraq and Afghanistan. Completed and turned into a Cabinet submission by the War Memorial. Again, as David sort of flagged, but I'll give it extra emphasis here, three times that submission was put forth and three times it was iced, or the first two times anyway, by the fall of, of Julie Gillard and then the failure of, of, um, of Labor to retain office. Compelling reasons though, and here's something I want to stress, compelling reasons for, the, for, the, for a new official history, the War Memorial and David argued to happen now against that considerable opposition that David noted so ably the proximity and sensitivity surrounding this, this effort, it was argued, ought not preclude it. Bean's first volume appeared in 1921, even if the last appeared sometime thereafter. So a new series written so closely to the events they were chronicling could provide a public so interested. Let me mark this as a challenge. A, pr a public so interested yet so disconnected 
from these events in the Middle East and East Timor with an authoritative account of Australian involvement. Well, that's all well and good, and some movement was made there, but the rather obvious spanner in the works soon emerged. If the peacekeeping official history traced ADF operations up to and including the first Iraq war, and the series now proposed in 2012 picked up the story of Afghanistan and the second war in Iraq, what of East Timor that keeps coming up? The blunt answer was not, of course, that David or the memorial had failed to consider operations in Timor from 1999 to 2012. Indeed, the expansion of the peacekeeping series to include Timor was always a sub submission in and of itself, wrapped up in broader omnibus cabinet submissions designed at getting a new series approved. At the same time, let me be a little blunter than David here, at the same time, political signals were such that it was pointless to press the issue. David had been warned off, as it were. There were sensitivities and their reputations mixed up, mixed up in events in East Timor that were much closer to home than those that could be uncovered by a study of Middle Eastern operation. And this marks one of the, uh, one of the challenges that I'll address a little bit later on to do with my project. Nonetheless, the decision that looked like an approval was looming and the extraordinary situation of two official history series potentially bracketing Timor without including it became apparent. This awkward and embarrassing proposition couldn't be allowed to stand and the suggestion moved back down from political circles to the more moral that perhaps it might be best if Timor was included. The irony, I'm sure, wasn't lost on Professor Horn or the memorial, who'd of course known this all along but had been stonewalled at every point in advance regarding East Timor. So what was originally proposed as a new six volume study of operations in the Middle East was extended to include a single volume on East Timor. At last then, early to mid 2015, the government did determine that an entirely new multi-volume official history, history series should be produced to document Australian involvement in Iraq 2003 to 11, that second Iraq, Afghanistan 2001 to 2014, and East Timor from 1999 to 2012. This then is the origin of my rather long and cumbersome title, forgive it on the emails I send out, of official historian of Australian operations in Iraq and Afghanistan and Australian peacekeeping operations in East Timor. That division still stands, as I'll outline, I do have oversight for dealing with <coughs> A series, <coughs> pardon me, a series on Middle Eastern operations and a separate se series dealing with, this with East Timor, all under the banner of that rather unwieldy title. But let's remember from the outset, the official history series over which I now preside was a function of a long and a complex process undertaken by Professor Horner and others designed to get the project approved by government. Political considerations, first and foremost, Historical considerations, a very distant second. At this point, events moved reasonably quickly, for me personally at least. The project appeared on my own personal radar. The position of official historian was advertised as a six-year non-continuing appointment at the War Memorial, a contractor's work that is. I applied for the job as one of many, a significant proportion of whom appeared to me at least to be a deal better qualified than myself. Nonetheless, and to my surprise, I was offered the position and I took it. Now. Between us and the four wars, not I've got to say in honesty without reservation. For I had had ample time to consider the range of challenges that awaited the new official, official historian. And Garth's presentation alluded to a few of them, but I'll get to some of those. My humble office at UNSW Canberra across the way looked increasingly warm and safe and cosy. Yet such an opportunity, as I'm sure you're well aware, would come but once in a lifetime and risks sometimes do need to be taken. Moreover, the difficulty of the job of which I was becoming increasingly aware was only surpassed, or matched at least, by its importance. I hold to this feeling still. Thus, after securing six years of leave without pay from my parent university, I began work at the memorial in March this year. From that point I was, and I am, very much focused on setting up the mechanics of this project. It's my job in the early phases to concern myself with issues of administration, issues of governance, interdepartmental relationships, so that authors and researchers can focus wholly and solely on their assigned volumes. They'll need such an undistracted focus and commitment 
if we're going to meet our remit. And on that remit, well, the national significance, significance of this project, in my mind, speaks for itself. Australia's involvement in the Middle East has been complex and long-running, as you've heard. Up to 30,000 ADF personnel are believed to have served or supported these operations over 13 years, 42 of whom have died in Afghanistan on active service. Hundreds have been wounded. Equally, Australia's involvement in East Timor from 99 to 2012 was instrumental in that nation gaining or moving along the path towards its independence. The Indifet deployment in 99 was Australia's largest mission conducted under UN auspices and the largest overseas deployment since Vietnam. Taken in total, these operations constitute an important part of Australia's recent past and one that clearly needed and needs to be chronicled in an analytical and a comprehensive manner. The formal offer to the position of official historian was made to me via a letter from the Prime Minister. The appointment was to a full-time position at the memorial, Mr Turnbull wrote, subject to my, me obtaining a top secret security clearance, the same level of clearance that all of my staff members must hold. And the task was made quite clear. Let me quote, you will be responsible for delivering the official histories by July 2022, the Prime Minister continued. Importantly, as with my predecessors, the Commission provided for full access to official government files pursuant to the Archives Act of 1983, subject only to national security requirements. The letter closed with a reminder, thanks a lot, not that one was really required, that Australia had had a long tradition of producing official histories telling the story of Australians at war. The role of the official historian is of great national significance, I was told. The shadows there not only have been and long, but Bob O'Neill and Peter Edwards and David Horner, perched on my shoulder, they're there still. So I did mention at the start of the talk the, the, some of the ways I think this project is going to differ. One key aspect in this regard is the type and the level of governance imposed upon and within this project. I've been well funded for this task. How many previous speakers have you heard say that? To the tune of $12.5 million. For this I am, of course, most grateful. It's a level of resourcing not available to past official historians. The flip side of deep government and war memorial investment in the project is, however, extremely tight timelines and a very rigid government governance framework. I do not, I must say, consider this to be inappropriate. To cut to the chase, we have six years to complete these dual series, including authorship of one of the volumes from myself. My other authors have five years to finish their respective volumes. This is a great deal tighter than any official history project to date. It's a tough ask. Yet funding allows for each author to be assigned a full-time research assistant. And in terms of project manage management, I'm also able to employ a full-time administrator and support officer. The project has further funds assigned for travel and for publication. These are the swings and these are the roundabouts. I'm sure that previous official historians, you caught my eye then, Peter, are staggered by the staff and the funds at my disposal, but I'm sure they're equally staggered by the expectations of delivery. This is a different project from those that preceded it. Perhaps another indication of the differences the project faces, labouring under those pretty considerable timelines, are the administrative structures that surround it. I am perhaps, I think it's fair to say, not as free some of my predecessors have been, but there's a saying that comes to mind about having a cake and eating it too. Importantly and honestly, I do not see the administrative framework associated with this project as an imposition because I helped build most of it. This is a public service project and needs to be managed as such. I also want to make another point clear and that is how much support that has been provided to me by that host institution, the War Memorial. Thus far, I say, in all honesty, every effort's been made to com accommodate my every request. Every door knocked on has already been open. In any case, back to administrative arrangements, not to bore you, but again to provide some of the distinct context of the project that we were undertaking. The very first committee established by me was an official history consultation group. I raised this group for the sole purpose of providing expert external and scholarly advice to me personally when issues or difficulties arose. 
The first task of this committee when it met was to examine the scope and volume structures of the, of the series as it was approved in mid-2015, mid largely on David's recommendations. The proposed volume structure, as I said before, was a single volume on Timor, two on Iraq and four on Afghanistan. The consultation group, after some discussion, was unanimous in its conclusion that this was perhaps not the best spread of volumes and it recommended changes. After all, as I mentioned earlier, this structure was a function of the long and complex process undertaken to get the project approved in the first place. The question of the inclusion of the Timor in the series was particularly vexed and only agreed upon after approval had been given to address both Iraq and Afghanistan. That is, a six volume study of the Middle East was envisaged well before the question of Timor was decided. East Timor was added to the project as a pseudo independent tack on volume. At no time was the original scope of the official history project the product of considered analysis or historical calculations. In this light, the consultation group recommended not one, but two volumes for East Timor, a single volume for Iraq, which may need to split into two in the future, and three volumes for Afghanistan. A chronological approach was to be maintained as it was in the peacekeeping, within volumes of the peacekeeping series. No standalone thematic volumes concerning single service activities or activities at a political strategic level were considered appropriate. You may have noticed a bit of a mis mis mathematical mismatch here in that what I've outlined totals six, not the seven volumes originally approved. The recommendation to reduce the series from seven to six was made on scholarly and on historical grounds, yet I'm not sh shy to admit to you all <coughs> that it also resulted in close to a million dollars in salary savings that I knew then, and as I know now, will be needed for other bridges once we, once we need to cross them. These recommendations were taken to the Memorial Senior uh, Management Group, which approved them immediately without question or complaint. The Memorial Council and the Department of Veterans Affairs was informed of the outcome, not asked for its opinion. The ease of passage of these recommendations in this regard gave me pause and a sigh of relief. This was the type of support and the relationship between the project and its host institution that might allow us to succeed. Well, the second big committee I raised is something I've called the Official History Records Access Steering Group, and that's a mouthful. The purpose of this group is to act as an SES, or a one-star coordination body, above the operational level of interaction between the project and select government departments. The term whole of government comes to the fore again including Foreign Affairs and Trade, the Prime Minister and Cabinet, the AFP and of course our main customer defence. Other relevant agencies, particularly those with an intelligence and security bent, vent, bent rather, have requested direct and singular access to the project via myself and aren't represented on this committee. More specifically, this committee will help identify the most appropriate methods by which necessary files and data will be made available and it's to the key issue of records and data, an issue flagged so well by Garth, that I'll now turn. I think a further and important indicator that this, history, this official history project cannot and will not be a mirror image of past experience is the nature of records involved and the proximity of conflicts, conflicts under examination. So I anticipate, in general and philosophical terms, data behind the volumes will come in two, two types requiring two distinct historical methodologies, as they invariably do. The first oral sources, of which I'm sure we're all familiar. One significant benefit of conducting this project so close to the conclusion of operations under scrutiny is a wholesale availability of veterans. Now, acknowledging the perpetual challenges of oral sources, my memory can't be trusted, I certainly don't uh, trust anyone else's, the nuances and explanations and stories behind what will not appear in the artificial consensus of the documentary record will be covered by a comprehensive interviewing program for all volumes. Unsurprisingly, the second source of data for this project will come from written, visual and hard copy documentary sources in a range, a range of formats, from cabinet papers to emails. These sources are, will be primarily from uniformed and civilian defence, including organisations like the Defence Intelligence Organisation and the Australian Signals Directorate, as DSD is now, now called. But given the nature of these conflicts, important contributions we require from all agencies uh, represented on that steering committee 
the DFATs and the PMCs and so on and so forth, as well as the Office of National Assessments, the United Nations, the Committee of the Red Cross, and I go on and on. Much defence data exists right now on the objective record management system and is, more or less, leaning towards the left side, searchable. In addition to objective accessioned material, either data, primarily from the earlier period, 99 to 2003, resides in more traditional hard copy repositories like the Army History Unit, Sea Power Centre, Air, uh, Office of Air Force History, various uh, current and now defunct defence headquarters and defence archives in places like Queanbeyan and Lidcombe. The procedure, this is important, the procedure by which the project will access this information across all re relevant government agencies, not just defence, has been settled upon by the Records Ac Access Steering Group. I'll give you a quick outline. First, the project will develop what we've called Requests for File Lists, or RF RFFs. Why not make an acronym? By volume. That is, an initial batch of six RFFs will be written by the project. These will indicate the types and nature of information sought by the project and, in the case of defence, where we think that information might have been generated or where it might be held. Next, that the project will submit the RFFs to those relevant agencies that I outlined and their representatives on the Records Access Steering Group. On receipt of those requests, those agencies will conduct and have undertaken to conduct internal record searches to prepare file lists for us. They will then be taken back to the project for, for internal distribution. For defence, that will require collating files from lists of multiple headquarters and commands and archives. Project authors will examine these file lists and determine a subset that they wish to view. These lists will be returned back to relevant agencies on the receipt of the returned file list, each will raise directly with the project through a, a working group that we're in the process of setting up to work out the details of access, which may come in a range of forms. We're experimenting with the availability within defence of copying of data that's on objective and dumping it into an official history folder for us to look at or print to do, do whatever we like with. That is one method. Other agencies, like uh, to an extent, like Foreign Affairs and Trade, will involve um, classified laptops and visits by researchers to physically look at and copy and take notes from data that's there. That's, in my mind, a working level arrangement. The high level arrangement is this procedure to see what people have and for us to make the decisions about what we want to see, not members of those departments. Now, the final type of record relevant to the project, and this is something that Garth did allude to so eloquently, is a large volume of data that has not been accessioned into objective or defence's legacy record management system, nor catalogued into a physical collection within defence, but rather that which sits unaccessioned in a collection of hard, -drived, hard drives returned from overseas at places like Headquarters Joint Operation Command and a number of other defence repositories. It's a lot, of, a lot of data, appearing upwards of 20 terabytes in the, in the case of Jock alone, literally millions of pages. These records are at present unsearchable and of no use. But there is always light at the tunnel. Defence has initiated a project called RORI, I can't remember what the acronym stands for, which is basically a process to electronically ingest these files, which go from 1999 to the present, into the objective record management system. By the end of July, today, phase one of that plan will have been completed. The aim here is to have a third of those hard drives uploaded. If that works, and I'll know soon enough, all should go well. The process of accessing this data will be through the same RFF procedure that I've described. Some of this data will be available in late 2016, most next year in 17, and the residual in 2018, assuming the technical actions attempted this month are successful. If there are problems, and there may well be, this may limit access to some of this information, but not fatally so. After all, this unsorted data is only a fraction of what is already on objective. This brings me to a more philosophical point that I have at discussions I have with people from time to time. Often this problem seems large, but I think we're predisposed as historians used to working in paper files. Of, uh, it's, it's good historical practice where we have a look at all the records. We've never looked at all the records, not once. What we've looked at those records someone put together and put in places like the Woolmore and the National Archives, a merest fraction of the historical record. 
We have to get over this notion that in order to write the history, we need to see everything. 20 million pages in one repository, we will never see anything. My point is, I don't see that as much different from before. The difference is, all the millions of sheaves of paper generated in New Guinea in World War II stayed in New Guinea, ended up in rubbish bins. Only some documents ever made at home. It's from those we write history. The difference here is all those scraps have been kept. It's a difference of process, not of problem. Let me continue though. I want to talk or finish off the talk by giving you a few words on my philosophy. I begin by saying, I think I differ very little from my predecessors in this regard. Official historians are in many ways, official histories are in many ways, a record of government actions and decisions based on government sources. They're a foundation or a scaffold for future historians, not an end word. And an accessible way for the public and veteran community to gain insight into operations under examination. Let me, let me reiterate something I mentioned earlier. I think this is particularly important today given what I'd call a serious di disconnection between these wars and the wider Australian public. I think it's important too, given what I describe as a significant mismatch between the public narrative of events in East Timor, Iraq and Afghanistan and what I might call a true historical record. The perception of Australian activities and decision making does not in many ways match wider understandings of those events. Let me cast your minds back, for example, to difficulties faced in gaining government approval to East Timor. There are reputations here and legacies in play that may not welcome a robust investigation or publication of the historical record. There are possibly institutional sensitivities at stake. There are contemporary political and diplomatic considera considerations that may find a searching study of, past, of recent past inconvenient. They are some of my challenges in response. Let me offer a simple outlook that will certainly be captured or has been captured in my briefs to authors and which will represent a philosophical pillar of this project. Like our predecessors, we will not self-censor. We will include the good with the bad Frictions and mistakes are as valid a part of the historical record as are triumphs. Success in spite of institutional shortcomings enhances the legacy of those involved, not the reverse. We will write as we see it and as the evidence trail indicates. If this outlook adds complications in five years time, and it will, they will be dealt with in five years time. The exception of course is always security considerations and I've got no problem with this. Other issues dressed up as security, however, may prove a different matter entirely. In terms of other aspects of my philosophy here, one member of the author selection panel for the job was wont to ask potential candidates which of the past official history series would they model their work most closely upon. It's a fair and it's an interesting question. My answer would have been Gavin Long. The central reason here is that Long worked under considerable weight of expectations set by Bean, so much so that many of you will be aware his notebooks and correspondence are bound with efforts by active serving officers to influence him with an eye to how they might look in a Bean Mark II series. Yet Long, particularly in To Benghazi, published in 1952, manages to my mind to weave in critiques and criticisms where appropriate without appearing cynical and within the context of what was expected of him. I've always appreciated this approach to type of bravery in the context of its time. The only problem here is perhaps, to me, his over subtlety. One needs to be aware of the problems to glean the full meaning of Long's tangential references. Most, I think, would have been lost on the wider public. To those within the ten, however, they would have stood out markedly. Given the framework, era and expectations he worked under, Long could hardly have been more explicit. I would hope to follow a similar line with the, with the caveat that with changing times and changing public expectations, I need not be so discreet. Yet Long had his faults, or more accurately, he made his concessions and he made his compromises. Again, if I use the example of Tu Benghazi, an otherwise comprehensive and excellent account, and admittedly with the multifaceted pressures that I mentioned and cumbered upon him, Long perpetuated many of the misguided wartime interpretations of events in North Africa. Interestingly, somewhat akin to Bean, he later co conceded that the, quote, one objective of the Australian war histories is frankly a nationalistic one, to contribute to the statement of a national tradition. 
Although less interested than his predecessor in glorifying the ideal and achievement of the individual Australian soldier, Long nonetheless mirrored Bean's stressing of the primacy of the Australian infantryman on the battlefield. His conclusions are seriously undermined by a determination not to break the Anzac tradition of making Australian infantry equipped with the individual and collective tools of an inherited national character key determinants of victory. Long was unequivocal that, quote, the decisive work in Africa was done by ingenious and resolute foot soldiers, making light of the all important British logistics, gunners, machine gunners and tank crews and so forth. Well aware at the time of his writing there were sufficient veterans left to challenge this rather ahistorical argument, Long chose to land the first blow, careful to make use of a colourful and obscuring analogy. Quote, to ascribe success either to tanks as the overwhelming arm, as some authors have done, or to the artillery, says Long, is to present Hamlet without the prince. Beautiful and poetic nonsense. It's easy, however, to point fingers, and I admit freely and openly that the blowtorch has yet to be applied on my project or myself. But at this stage, I choose not to follow such a path. My aim is not a nationalistic one. It is not celebratory. It's not commemorative. It is historical, purely and simply. The day this project, project fails to engage with difficult and sensitive issues in a forthright manner is the day that credibility is lost. There are too many veterans around who know better. And that's not my own personal style in any case. Yet I say this now where philosophies are cheap and words are simple to cast, ask me again in six years time. All of which brings me back to the question at the heart of this conference for the last two days. That is, does Bean loom large for me and the most recent official history series? Or is he withdrawing into the shadows? Like any good historian, let me give you an annoyingly qualified answer. As I've alluded to throughout this talk, my project and Bean's epic undertaking share little common ground in terms of process, context, and the mechanics of research and writing. In this regard, Bean feels of little use to me. He has little to tell. Even in terms of audience, times have changed dramatically since Bean's volumes were published. I feel the educated public and veteran community is more cynical, for example, in positive and in negative ways. They are perhaps more willing to accept and digest criticisms of defence and government decisions and actions than perhaps in the past. In this regard, I'm perhaps freer to tell the blunt truth than a Bean or a Long might ever have been. On the other hand, there might be portions of our readership so enamoured of the Bean-inspired connection between military achievement and national identity as to reject some of our more difficult f uh, findings and conclusions out of hand. Where Bean does sit on my shoulder, however, is less connected to the conduct of my project as to the weight of expectation I believe I've placed on myself. Bean made what the conception of an official historian is in Australia and what it represents. It's that legacy that I feel above all. Thank you. Craig, I was talking to John Howard last month about our conference in November, and I said, oh, my colleague Craig Stockens is doing the official history of Australia in Iraq, Afghanistan, and East Timor. And he shot back straight away, well, that doesn't make sense. <laughs> In contrast to our good friend Peter Edwards, who had no connection with Vietnam whatsoever, you are writing a volume about a conflict in which you were there on day one and have already declared certain views. Can you help us understand how you can claim objectivity in that context? Yeah, first, I think the fact that I was there is no particular um, benefit to writing this history. That sounded dramatic, Tom. But I was in East Timor as a, as a newly minted captain. My frame of reference and understanding at the time was so narrow and so shallow as to what I'm researching now barely makes a connection with what I remember to be the case. I would also say that, and I didn't have time to mention it in the talk, that the focus of this project, one of its guiding characteristics, I guess, is we, this is an operational level study. This is not digger history from below. It's not political history from above but it requires enough of at the top end and at the bottom end to give it context. What I'm actually writing about never crossed my mind when I was walking around on the ground at the time. So yes, I think it's, I think it's actually a negative more than a positive, but I'll actually give another reason. It's got nothing to do with historical veracity or the craft. 
it's going to take me six months or more to set the project up. I've got, I got the same amount of time every other author. I don't have time to, to, to begin on a project that, that I didn't already understand. And I had been working on East Timor as part of a university ARC project for the last 12 months. So I guess in practical terms that gives me a 12 month head start on the other authors and time and space to do the project management work as well. None of those are good historical reasons but they are reasons. Right, thank you. Your question. Craig, you mentioned, and I don't know whether it was kind of a throwaway bit or not, that the main customer was defence. And then towards the end, you talked about wanting to make a history, or at least if I've interpreted it correctly, a history that will help the man in the street, woman in the street, understand all of this. And then you just said it's an operational level one. <laughs> yeah. For but, How are you going to do no. this? Firstly, Liz, my main customer in terms of records access is defence, not the, not the reading audience. So maybe that was poorly expressed. When I say operational level, that's, that's the level of which the volumes are pitched, not the audience. Operational level of war, if you like. Yeah? In terms of my audience, I consider the audience to be an educated private citizen with no knowledge of defence. It's not an insider trading. You don't have to understand the system to be able to read these books. But nor are they simplified so much as to use the complexity and nuance that is the truth about these, inf about these types of operations. An educated layperson. Thank you. Thanks for a very interesting talk. Um, just you know, going back to your volume structure, I was trying to note it down as you, as you were going. Yeah, I went a bit fast, probably. Yeah. And you amended it, and I couldn't write fast enough. But you, I don't think you mentioned that there'd be an overall uh, diplomacy and strategy. Model. I mentioned there wouldn't be. Right, um, okay. Uh, so does that mean, for example, if you've got two volumes on Iraq, that one would be strategy and diplomacy and one would be operations, or do you have something else in mind? No, it, it, means, it means that all of the volumes ought to be understandable of themselves and in their own right. It doesn't mean we shirk those issues. We need to understand, I mean, the Middle East, though, the operations in Iraq and Afghanistan are certainly separate. The political context, if you like, Australia's strategic positioning is shared. Yes, there's going to be some demarcation lines. For example, the first Afghanistan volume will take on a lot of the Middle East naval operations, which stretch across both the Gulf operations. It will make those sort of demarcation lines. Um, but each of those volumes does need to, to contain and will contain enough context so that they make sense. Yeah, as a, according to the principle I mentioned before, enough from above and enough from below so that the middle bit makes sense. In the, at the home front for that matter as well. But if there's a second Iraq volume, where will it start and where will it end? There isn't a, chronological. There isn't a second Iraq volume yet. That's, that's a suck it and see if there needs to be first. If there is, then we make those decisions at that time. And you'll split it in what way? We don't know yet. I don't know if we need to split it yet, Tom. Okay, all right. That's fine. Uh, but I, I can't, I can, sorry, I can't answer that question a little better and say how we've split the Afghanistan volumes. And if that is a process, the process that's underway between the Afghanistan authors, we're going to do them as we can chronologically. There's nothing like chronology to make history make sense, right? But also without, without arbitrary breakages. The, the volumes need to make sense in and of themselves. So, for example, the last volume starting in 2010 might begin when the Dutch withdrawal happens because the entire nature of the deployment changes at that point. So it's both chronological but also at a natural break point. Yeah, but I wasn't trying to push you where you didn't want to go. Would you just do the, the, the um, pre-positioning, the invasion, and immediately afterwards stop, and then have a second volume like that? But as you say, it's too early to tell too early the to scope tell. of the task. Yeah. Peter Edmonds, thank you. Uh, Craig, it's uh, great to see what uh, capable hands and broad shoulders are uh, running this, uh, this new project. Uh, uh, that was a very impressive uh, uh, paper, and I thank you. Just on this question of the the role of strategy and diplomacy vis-a-vis uh, -vis operational. Um, <clears throat> yes, it's true that you need enough of the, uh, the scrap and dip uh, to understand the operations, but equally you need enough, uh, uh, well, you know, they interact as it were, you need both to understand either. Um, and I think in the wake of the Chilcot inquiry, 
uh, and the, the current quarterly essay, uh, The Firing Line, by uh, James Brown, who served, as you know, in, in both uh, Iraq and Afghanistan, and happens to be Malcolm Turnbull's son-in-law. Um, I think there is going to be enormous interest in the political decision-making that led um, particularly to Iraq and almost as much to, to Timor. Mm. So um, are you confident that you'll be able to, to, to cover that uh, in as much detail as uh, the people from all points of view who are going to be poring over every word and looking for every possible uh, escape clause or whatever um, are you confident you'll be able to include that to the extent that you wish? Yeah, thank you, Peter. When I say sufficient, that doesn't necessarily mean a little bit. In the example I use, or use my own volume, probably the one that's been scoped more thoroughly because it's had a lead time here. For, and I'm going to write only on 99 and 2000 interfet deployment. From what I plan to be 22 chapters, nine of those will occur before there's a boot on the ground. So when I say sufficient political and diplomatic and intelligent context, depends on the volume, but sufficient doesn't necessarily mean a little bit. It means enough that's required to do exactly the, what you've said. In that case, in that case, almost half of the volume. Yes, yeah, sure, and, and, <laughs> and I've been prompted just to mention that Bob Stevenson over there is picking up the second team or volume which will pick up from 2000 to 2012. That volume perhaps may not require half of the volume to set the scene because of what's been done before. Chris. Um, thanks. Look, at the risk of this uh, table, you know, asking too many questions, um, another question. Um, look, Craig, again, congratulations on your appointment. And it seems pretty clear to me as a, just a bystander that the process is in excellent hands, so I'm sure it's going to be extremely well done. But I, I've just been thinking about some of the things you've been saying and some of the things that you're saying you won't do. And I know we'll have a chance in the last session to, to look over the whole two days and to, to draw some broad conclusions, but I thought it was really interesting that you said that your purpose is not commemorative, it's not celebratory. And you also made it extremely clear that, um, you know, the highest sort of historical standards are really what are going to drive you. And that just made me think about the role of the historian in civic society. You know, we're, we're used to thinking of, uh, I guess, the press as being a source of independent comment about what governments do. But it seems to me that, that you've outlined a role for the historian, which is quite similar. It's, it's that level of scrutiny, it's a type of um, uh, allowing a type of transparency uh, which I think is really admirable. So, I mean, that's more of a statement than a question. But I wonder, is there any comment? Yeah, well, he, here's the thing. He, a lot of work I've done um, has, in the past has been surrounding World War II. So I've had the time and opportunity to look at Long's notebooks, for example, in depth, and the private papers of a lot of the key generals and actors of, of the era. When they are communicating with the official, official historian, it's usually in terms of letter writing, the picture they want to be portrayed, not only for their own, their own personal legacy, but the wider legacy, is a good news story. This is what worked, this is what worked. Very reticent, though it happens, quite reticent to say, actually this didn't work, and this, these are the reasons. I've interviewed around 90 senior ADF members so far for Interfet at this stage. Um, decision makers, and some public servants too, and we'll continue to keep going in that direction. The message I get from them is, make sure this is right. This didn't work. This didn't happen. This is not what occurred. This is the real truth. I think society's moved on from their expectations of what history ought to be. Even the veterans have moved on. They, the message I get is, tell the dirty truth, don't whitewash it. It's not bravery on my part in, in some ways. It's reflecting that that. That, that vibe, I think it's a different vibe that I get from Long's notebooks. I think times have really changed. And the, hence my comment about cynicism in positive and negative ways. In six years' time, we're going to have another event like this, I think, or something like it. And uh, we will hold these words that you've shared with us today, not so much to throw them at you, but to say, did it turn out to be like this? 
and if force of character is an important thing for a historian to have, and it will shape the final work, uh, I hope that that will be vindicated in the books that we see. Would you please send a